The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to John. Jesus went to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, also called the Sea of Tiberias. A large crowd kept following him because they saw the signs that he was doing for the sick. Jesus went up the mountain and sat down there with his disciples. Now the Passover, the festival of the Jews, was near. When he looked up, and saw a large crowd coming toward him, Jesus said to Philip, Where are we to buy bread for these people to eat? He said this to test him, for he himself knew what he was going to do. Philip answered him, Six months' wages would not buy enough bread for each of them to get a little. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, There is a boy here who has five barley loaves and two fish. But what are they among so many people? Jesus said, Make the people sit down. Now there was a great deal of grass in the place, so they sat down, about 5,000 in all. Then Jesus took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed them to those who were seated, so also the fish, as much as they wanted. When they were satisfied, he told his disciples, gather up the fragments left over so that nothing may be lost. So they gathered them up, and from the fragments of the five barley loaves left, those, left by those who had eaten, they filled 12 baskets. When the people saw the sign that he had done, they began to say, This is indeed the prophet who is to come into the world. When Jesus realized that they were about to come and take him by force to make him king, he withdrew again to the mountain by himself. When evening came, his disciples went out to the sea, got into a boat, and started across the sea to Capernaum. It was now dark and Jesus had not yet come to them. The sea became rough because a strong wind was blowing. When they had rowed about three or four miles, they saw Jesus walking on the sea and coming near the boat, and they were terrified. But he said to them, It is I. Do not be afraid. Then they wanted to take him into the boat, and immediately the boat reached the land, Towards which they were going. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Did you know that Jesus had a sermon that flopped? Like, it was really bad. He started the sermon with perhaps hundreds of people around him, but by the time he finished, only the 12 apostles were left. Actually, he had two sermons like that. The other one was so bad that the congregation literally tried to throw him off a cliff. And my guess is if your experience of preaching is like that, that people want to murder you, people walking out may not be so bad. <laughs> Tell you what, I'm going to come back to that. Uh, I want to give you a little bit of what's going on in our scripture readings for the next couple of weeks. Our cycle of reading scripture, the lectionary, has been and will be moving through the gospel of Luke, or excuse me, Mark, hitting the highlights and most of the rest of the shorter stories of Jesus. We've been moving steadily on this path, 
from just after Trinity Sunday, and we're going to be going this way until the beginning of Advent in December. But now, the lectionary is putting the brakes on, like a scenic detour, because at this point, almost inexplicably, we leave Mark. And today and for the next four Sundays, we'll be focused on just the sixth chapter of the Gospel of John. Now, the broad outline of the chapter is this. Jesus feeds 5,000, and then he ghosts the crowd. He disappears. The crowd eventually catches up with him in Capernaum, and he tries to teach them how to interpret the miraculous sign of the multiplication of the loaves and fishes, how to go beyond the literal miracle to understanding how the sign points to Jesus as the source of sustenance for eternal life in God. The many cannot bear the teaching, and by the end of the chapter, Jesus is watching as hundreds walk away, going home, never to follow him again. He turns to his disciples and asks, do you also want to leave? But at that moment, the 12 reaffirm their commitment to Jesus. Peter says, to whom can we go? You alone have the words of life. The lectionary leaves out that part of the conversation, and that's fine. There will be enough text to chew on in these coming weeks, but it's quite illuminating that the gospel we might be willing to accept and to trust repelled hundreds the day that it was first preached. That's the story of John 6. The miracle did not change, but people's self, or excuse me, people's understanding of what Jesus was saying about himself was so out of the realm of what people wanted, that once he said it, he was left standing by himself with his disciples. So here's how you might get the most out of the next month of our scripture lessons in worship. Take the time to read through John 6. One read through will take you no more than five minutes, I promise you. And it will help the readings seem less disjointed over the next few weeks because you will see the trajectory of Jesus' teaching. And if you want to up the intensity on that and get even more out of the text, level two would be to reread John 6 every Sunday as we go through the chapter. It contains so much. It's so rich. It has implications for our understanding of what the Eucharist is. It has bearing on our understanding of who Jesus is to God and vice versa. And it's an example of how Jesus made a practice out of subverting everyone's expectations. All right, that ends our moment about the lectionary. Now to the real point. And don't worry, I'm watching the clock. You're going to get out of here on time. (laughs) The one thing that I keep coming back to in this story, I've come back to it every week especially since I know where this chapter is going to end, is this. The crowd Jesus feeds, who was willing to make Jesus king by force, will utterly abandon him within 24 hours. Did you catch that part? Jesus, therefore, perceiving that they were going to come and take him by force to make him king, withdrew again to the mountain, himself alone. Jesus intentionally frustrates the crowd's desire to elevate him to power. There are reasons for this which highlight a theme running through the entirety of Scripture. And one underlying theme in the Hebrew Scripture is a pessimism about humanity, particularly our fallibility and our weakness. As the author to Ecclesiastes puts it, there is not a just person upon earth that does good, that sins not. In Scripture, this opinion of humankind is especially pointed at human rulers. The narrative of the books of Judges, of Samuel, of Kings, and Chronicles is how Israel's desire to have a king like every other nation, as it's put, would lead them away from God. In fact, in 1 Samuel chapter 8, God and Samuel give entire speeches about how kings are not a good idea. But the people respond, and I quote, No. We're determined to have a king over us so that we may also be like other nations and that our king may govern us and go out before us and fight our battles. And the majority 
of the rest of the historical books and the prophets of the Bible are essentially saying, you got what you wanted. Look how that turned out. Ever-increasing injustice and corruption, righteous prophets needing to go into hiding to avoid being killed by those rulers, a divided kingdom, a destroyed temple, mass murder, and exile. The New Testament continues this theme. We have the examples of Herod, a genocidal maniac who kills three, or excuse me, everyone under the age of three. We have Pontius Pilate, who with truth standing right in front of him, asks what is truth. We have Jesus refuting Satan's offer of control of the kingdoms of the world and the temptations, and we have Jesus here turning down people striving to give him that power. There are at least two reasons for Jesus' refusal. The first is that the exercise of worldly power at its best is a compromise between competing goods, but it's also often a grasp for control gained through coercion and born of fear and suspicion of each other. This is morally antithetical to God's reign of love, and Jesus will have none of it. The second reason is that humanity is often willing to settle for a good enough. We want to enthrone someone who will fight our battles. We will choose lesser evils all the day long if it promises us security and safety. Imagine the eventual disappointment for those who desire control and security once the king they enthrone starts saying things like, you have to lose your life to find it. Take up your cross and follow me unto death. Jesus saves them the trouble, tells them what's what up front, and lets them walk away when they realize they were not getting what they wanted. Was Jesus' sermon a flop, or was his truth too hard to bear? Just as Jesus refused to use the tools of worldly wielded power and be turned into another of a long line of failed insurrectionists in Second Temple Judaism during that time, Jesus will not be made a king by us if our goal is to figure out how to turn him into the cosmic hedge on our bets on a future we prefer. In other words, our faith in God in Christ are not tools to be wielded or elemental powers to be mastered. And part of the hard work of faith and trust in God is learning how to let God actually be God, to let God be seated as ruler in our lives on God's own terms, not our own. It means to learn to understand and go deep in the sense of understanding what is the length and breadth and depth and height of a peace that surpasses understanding. It's a daily choice we make as we have to choose to let Jesus conform us to himself and his gracious rule, maybe even hour by hour. At least that's how it feels for me. And in the process, we may find ourselves surprised by the growth that we see when we are willing to let God and Christ be themselves in the midst of our lives. Amen.